So, well, hi everyone. Have everyone joining us online and also thank you all for joining here at Tyler today. Uh, my name is Anne Chi. I'm the curator of education and public programs and Parasite. And today is the last day of our exhibition, Got About Six Seasons. And uh, after today, um, the show will travel actually to two locations, uh, both to Savi Contemporary in Berlin and also to Passmanju Triennial in Nepal in 2021. So um, although it's a really busy time for us at Parasite, because this is the, our like annual fundraising season, um, but we're still super happy. We're able to organize several public programs for Garden of Six Seasons before it closes. So just an hour ago, we have two very great successful guided tours by our intern Ariel Chen. She's over there. Thank you so much for doing the tour. Um, and now I'd like to introduce a talk um, by Yasmin Afshar who will share her research and also her perspective on Emma Kunz, Swiss artist and healer who has three beautiful drawings presented uh, in one of six seasons. So I will introduce um, Yasmin Afshar to everybody. Yasmin is an art historian and also works as a curator in Switzerland. She has been co-running the nomadic discussion platform La Foya in process since 2018. Also as a freelance author, she regularly publishes in monographs and also topical publications, and also has been a member of various juries and also commissions, including Swiss Federal Arts Commission. So before entering today's talk um, uh, with Jasmine on Emma Kunz, I would also like to thank Consulate General of Switzerland in Hong Kong for sponsoring today's closing reception and also all the events. So may I welcome Katia, Deputy Council uh, General, to speak a few words with us. I'll maybe just <laughs> do this. Well, uh, thank you very much. I'm uh, Katia Stanfli, uh, Deputy Council General. I don't know if I should look in the back <laughs> or on the screen. That's uh, the challenge of the new situation and the technology. Um, well, thank you uh, to Parasite uh, for inviting us to the closing ceremony. Uh, I, we are today the second, for me personally, was the second time that I could see uh, this, um, this beautiful exhibition and so the one on Zoom uh, missed, or maybe with the ones in Hong Kong, I hope they had a chance to see it. For the ones here, I hope, um, I don't know what's for you, but I was very inspired uh, by all this artwork. Uh, it's a beautiful exhibition then. I, both times while I was walking through the artworks and especially if they are explained, I felt my, my soul nourished. Uh, and this is something very beautiful of art. And I find it even more interesting when some of the uh, artists like Emma Kunz are actually healer. Exactly. So it's, uh, it's all getting together and it's all be connecting. So here the older artwork are on, some are about uh, traditional uh, Chinese medicine, and also some more experimental. And I'm sure now the talk by um, Yasmin will be even more inspiring and will uh, complete for us this, uh, uh, this walk um, through some of the artwork by Emma Kunz. So thank you very much to Yasmin. Thank you to Parasite thank you. for this uh, great job. Uh, keep up also with the difficult situation of COVID yes. and uh, very happy about the partnership. So no more uh, time from myself. <laughs> thank, thank you, you. so much, Katia. So in the next 30 or 40 minutes, uh, we're going to uh, join uh, Yasmin on her presentation on Emma Kunz. So uh, Yasmin will walk us through um, some practice and also the history, bio history of uh, Emma Kunz. And also we will learn about how Emma Kunz is kind of rediscovered by art history. So without further ado, uh, Yasmin, shall we start? Yes. That's great. Please um, make some signs if you don't understand me or if there is something unclear. Yeah. And uh, otherwise, I would um, try to start with the presentation. Yes. Do you see it? Yes, we can see it. Wonderful. So um, then I will um, start. So uh, thank you very much. Anti and Katya for the introduction and uh, of course thank you very very much for this um, 
invitation to, to give a talk about Emma Quentz. As a um, art historian curator working in Switzerland and researching Emma Quentz, it's uh, quite exciting to know about these works now being on display in Hong Kong and that they will travel on um, to, to Kathmandu. Because if you look at the biography of this historical figure, there are almost no signs that could um, that there are no signs for this um, success and attention that she has nowadays. So I'm very much interested in exactly this development also. So what were the um, what were the requirements? What there were the premises? And what, what were the contexted contexts um, that made this um, development able and this um, this uh, kind of development into what we consider Emma Quentz now when we are looking at her works in an art museum. So I think this is, uh, Emma Quentz is a very nice example also for, um, for a historical figure that is now um, um, discovered again somehow because finally there is also this um, interest of uh, not the um, the classical figure of the artist, but we have a more holistic view on the art. The concept of art has very much expanded in the last, um, let's say, 40 years, 50 years. So um, I think also in this context, Emma Quentz is a very interesting example how we can get a wider, a broader view on what art is or can be. So what I'm going to tell you about is um, mostly who Emma Quentz was. We will see it's not an easy question to answer. Um, afterwards, I will focus on, on this history of reception on the question what happened after Emma Quentz's death, how she was discovered and um, what happened until now, 2020. And um, as a little preview or conclusion, I will say a couple of words about um, the project I'm currently working on in um, Aarau at the Aargauer Kunsthaus which puts Emma Quentz into dialogue with contemporary artists. And um, just as a, like a starting point, um, and my, um, or like the background of my interest in Emma Quentz is obviously the place I'm working, the museum I'm working. The Argauer Kunsthaus was um, in 1973, the place where the first exhibition of Emma Quentz drawing took place in, in, in the art context or in, in, in general. So, and we are one of the very few museums also who have um, uh, Emma Quentz drawings in their collection. So this is like the starting point I'm referring to and um, analyzing and discussing the, like what the, the shifts that somehow happened between 73 and now where we can say that Emma Quentz is part of a contemporary art um, um, of the comp contemporary art um, construct somehow. So, but um, let's first start with, um, let me see. So, um, with uh, the question, who Emma Coins was? I mentioned it's not a easy question to answer. This is mainly because, and this is from my perspective, very important to keep in mind, there is um, no, almost no written records by Emma Quentz herself. So she did not have a diary that we could consult nowadays to get information about her. She did not take notes about her drawings, about experiments she did. She was even, um, it's recorded that uh, she was quite skeptical when it came to language, to words, because she, she apparently she said that um, the languages are or language or words, the verbal spoken um, words are too, um, too one dimensional and uh, all her practice is about being multi dimensional. And this, um, so we have like, as the main um, thing to look at and to discuss um, we have the drawings. We have these uh, large drawings. You saw three of them in the exhibition. There are in total around 500 um, that can be called like the, the what, what she left on the one hand side, but also her means of communication. And this very um, way of communicating somehow, this um, expression 
which is not verbally, which is nonverbal and, and visual, I consider as um, one of these aspects that make Emma Coins very contemporary also, because um, this, um, there is the, the need to, to, to question and criticize how history has been um, transmitted until now in words, in languages, and we are about to, to question exactly this, um, these written uh, and linear histories. And I think this, this, um, this nonverbal visual expressions of Emma Quentz is a, is a, is a, a nice example of, of, of an alternative way of, of communication. So basically what we know about Emma Quentz is not first-hand, but second-hand. There have been um, interviews conducted, um, most of them 10 years after her um, death, when she was introduced into the art context. And this is the, the main source of information we have about um, Emma Quentz. And um, so from this source, we can still nevertheless put together a, a biography and then have um, um, insights of, about her life, her practice, her character, and so on. So uh, Emma Quentz was born in um, 1892 in a village called um, Britnau in the state of Argau in Switzerland in a rather poor family. She only attended primary school. And um, so she did not have any higher education. And what is really important also to, to um, consider, she never went to an art school. So she has no professional um, background in, in her artistic practice. She, um, here we have a picture of her as a 20, around 20 year old uh, young woman. Apparently she became aware of her um, special abilities, capacities at a very early age. She started being active in the realms of telepathy and prophecy. She started taking up her healing practice. She started taking up um, radiastasia, the, the work with a pendulum. Here we have a picture of um, her pendulum. It was a special, um, specially made pendulum construction for herself with two bowls. The left one is um, out of silver and the right one is uh, out of jade. And in the back, we have um, a so-called orientation plate where we see this cross and this, this plate um, helped her to, to transfer the movements of the pendulum to the drawings. We will talk about the drawings um, later. So um, she started, um, started also being known as a healer and people started to come her with um, um, medical, psychological problems um, to, in the search of, of, of help. It um, nevertheless took quite some years more until she started doing these particular drawings she's known now for. She started doing them at the age of 46. Here we have a very nice um, image of her in her studio, in her working place where we see her with a ruler in, a, in the hand and the pencil. And um, so she started doing these, um, these, uh, these, graph, uh, these drawings on graph paper in around um, 38 and continued doing them until she died. And she, she um, we think there are around 500 of these um, drawings. What is also important is that none of them is dated, none of them is titled, none of them is of course signed because these drawings were really tools of her healing practice. She did not make made them for the purpose to produce a drawing, a, a picture to put on a wall and look at it, but really they were a, a means of um, her practice. So basically out of these interviews, we, we have an idea how, how she, um, she made them, while there are also many, many questions and many discussions of how exactly, but uh, we can um, assume that each drawing was um, in the first place or based on a question or maybe a vision, a question that could um, be, um, 
that could be a question of Emma Quentz herself, a general question, or it could be a particular question posed by a patient of her. Um, based on this question, she would um, use the pendulum, which would um, show her points on the graph paper, where, which were at like, the starting point of where she would um, um, develop the, the drawing, the complex geometrical system. So if you look, um, that's more for those who are in Hong Kong on site, if you look um, very closely on the drawings, you see little um, pencil points, which are most probably the, um, the points she, she put on first, um, which like the pendulum told her where to put. And from there on, she developed um, the, the, the connecting lines um, and uh, as the last step, apparently the colors came. But for instance, with the colors, we have no um, idea exactly what the meaning of them is, how she chose them and so on. So these are like uh, these questions or myths also about the, how these, um, these, these drawings were, were made. Um, it's what's surprising probably is uh, that if we go through um, those drawings which are still there, um, what's surprising is the, the big variety of, of different forms also, because the, the procedure was always the same. Um, and so it's it's kind of um, it's it's kind of surprising how different the, the results were in the end. Even though all of the drawings are more or less the same size, there are, um, many of them are um, around one meter times one meter. Um, all of them are on graph graph paper, but still there are many different um, sujet motifs and so on. So um, there are these. Um, these um, motifs we have here one example where we see kind of a, a figurative language somehow here we have an animal shaped um, form there are other works with uh, human figures in it many of the works are um, um, central perspective um, based they have a look a little bit like a, a mandala um, many of the works are colored, but not all of them. Some are, um, are more linear like this one or have very little color in it. Um, she used um, colored pencils and sometimes also um, chalk, colored chalk to, to do these, um, these drawings. Most of them there um, are symmetric in some um, in some sense but some of them are not so it's really like a, a huge um, range and variety and um, some people tried to to kind of make sense out of this to try to try to make groups tried to also to to say something about the formal development throughout the years but in the end, we don't know exactly, or we can't, it's not really proven when which um, drawings are made. Um, what we know is that she um, started a drawing and um, worked on it until it was finished. That could um, take up to 24 hours where it is said that uh, she wouldn't eat or drink um, during this time, but really work on, on, the, on the drawings. And um, once the drawing was finished, she also um, sometimes called a neighbor, for instance, and, and uh, wanted to talk about um, the, the drawing and what it means to her. But as said before, no takes, uh, no notes were taken about what, what she said about. And uh, she also refused any, let's say, recordings of what she told, said about this, this drawing. And um, another point which um, is important, it's also um, kind of gets clear when we look at the image of her in her studio, is that 
she would never put away a finished uh, drawing forever, but she would reuse them. And I think this is also one of these aspects which makes her practice so contemporary. She is uh, very much embracing this um, notion of um, repetition of uh, appropriation also, um, and would reuse these, um, these drawings for instance, for a for a new questions coming question coming up by a patient, or also for um, some some new visions or questions, general questions by herself. So she would use the pendulum again on a um, uh, a existing drawing. So if somebody would come to her, she would uh, think about the drawings she made and um, go through them and take down one and put it on the table and discuss this somehow with her patient. So I think this is also an um, um, important, um, important notion. And also, if we go closely to the drawings, we see the, the, the holes where they were fixed. And um, if there are, for instance, many holes, or if we see a lot of um, um, fingerprints or, or, or um, like little folds in the paper, we can assume that um, this was a drawing that she used a lot. And others, we see they were almost not touched anymore. So we can assume that this was not such an important drawing in her practice somehow. So these are the signs um, which the, the, the drawings themselves give, give us. During their, her lifetime, Emma Quince never exhibited these drawings. She showed them to her patients and so on, but never, um, never exhibited them publicly. But, and this is also um, interesting, it is recorded that she repeatedly said that there will be the time, once there will be the time when people will understand her works. And there is this um, famous um, saying, prediction by her, that, um, that apparently she, she repeated um, a couple of times and which says that, um, she said her drawings were destined for the 21st century. So this is, of course, also something to, um, to discuss when we are now in the 20th century and we are kind of um, facing this high attention um, she has. So what's um, important in the case of um, Emma Quince is uh, that she had many fields of activities. Of course, we now in the exhibition, um, there are these drawings that are probably the most famous aspect of her, um, of her practice, but it's important to, to consider that the um, drawings were one aspect of many. So Emma Coins was also active in, um, the, in, in different research fields. She was interested in the symbolism of, of numbers. She was interested in, in botany. She had this um, uh, practice somehow in clairvoyance and telepathy. She um, is known from, for, her, um, for her activities as a naturopath. In, she was a herbalist also working. Um, she had a big garden with a lot of herbs that she used to, to make um, certain um, medicines somehow. And um, there are many healing successes um, recorded that she had during, um, she accomplished during her lifetime. So I think this is um, important to keep in mind. And what's also interesting is that um, she herself, she considered herself to be a researcher. And um, now we are talking of her about an artist. This is what happened afterwards. But if you look at the interviews which were conducted during her lifetime, there it, uh, during the, her lifetime after her death, but um, with people who knew her, I'm sorry, um, there we see that uh, most of the people or like most, um, the big part of the memories is about her as a healer, how she cured people, how she solved problems and so on. So um, people do refer to the drawings, but it's not that important for like the people um, who know her uh, in her living places or who, who 
got to her, she was a healer. So we really have these different um, um, views on her. The, she herself considered as a, herself as a researcher, then we have that afterwards seeing herself as an artist and then the, the contemporary view on her as a healer. So it's really like these different um, disciplines coming together. And at the same time, um, Emma Quentz was, um, let's say a maverick, a loner. She did not have really any exchange with, um, for instance, other researchers or other healers. She was not aware of the contemporary art um, scene by then in Switzerland. She was not even in touch really with the Anthroposophical um, Association, which would kind of be obvious because they, they also have this um, holistic worldview and share many, um, many aspects um, or many ideas that are also important to Emma Quentz. Um, it is known that she was aware of, of, the, of um, Rudolf Steiner and uh, his, um, his, uh, his anthroposophical school in, in Dornach, which is pretty close to where she grew up. So it's all, it's all like geographically also close, but um, apparently she never went there. She, she almost did not travel. Um, she, but people would come her and otherwise she would, um, it's recorded that she always kept saying that she needs to, to draw, she needs her time to, to, to draw, she's not able to, to, to travel. So there was almost no um, exchange. In um, 1942, um, Emma Quentz discovered the um, healing clay healing stone, nowadays uh, called Ion A, in a Roman quarry in um, Würenlos, which is close to Zurich. And um, this uh, particular healing clay is uh, still sold nowadays in um, chemistries in Switzerland. And it's probably from a Swiss perspective, like um, almost that famous as the drawings themselves. So they, it, there is a tradition of um, using this healing clay for um, a, a big variety of health issues, mainly um, for, for um, joint and muscular pains, but also for um, skin disorders um, and so on. So there is a whole um, variety of this. Um, this um, Roman quarry, where she, she discovered the stones is um, she considered it as a as a high um, energy place, and um, she found this place in connection with um, a um, a patient she had, who was a little boy suffering from polio, and uh, this quarry was uh, owned by the father of this boy. So um, apparently um, this treatment with uh, this, um, this uh, soil, this clay was uh, successful. And um, also this family um, stayed in touch with um, Emma Quentz. And I'm saying this because this family became, became very important in the history of reception as this little boy um, being healed from polio by Emma Quentz later becomes the estate manager. And uh, he is also the, he's called Anton C. Meyer, and he's also the founder of the Emma Quentz Foundation, the Emma Quentz Centrum, which is now in this place where the grotto is, where this quarry is, um, in uh, Würenlos near Zurich. And so this particular place is also accessible now to the public. And there is also a small museum with works by Emma Quentz next to it. So this is also this um, story. Um, going on. In um, 1951, Emma Quentz moves away from her hometown where she was born in the state of um, um, Argau. She moved to the state of Appenzell, which is in the eastern part of um, Switzerland. Mainly, or one reason is, is also because she was um, she was, um, she was kind of um, criticized or on, under the radar of the, um, of the officials in the state of Argau because of her um, practice as a, as a naturopath, as a healer. 
and she moved to this um, part in Switzerland, which is um, which was and still is a place where healers and naturopaths can practice freely. She built a house there for herself, which we see on 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 the image below, and um, she also lived alone from then on. Back in her hometown, she shared a house together with her um, sisters. And uh, then in Appenzell, she even had a more secluded um, life and appreciated this, um, this, this uh, quietness she had there. Um, Emma Quince um, stayed, uh, was a, had a single life all her life but um, apparently she didn't like to be questioned about that. And this is a very nice anecdote um, recorded is that um, here this picture on the left shows um, the entrance of her, of her house in, in, in Appenzell. And apparently there was always a, a um, man's hat and coat like symbolizing that um, there was a man in the house. So she didn't, um, so people wouldn't ask her any questions. Because of course, at that time, it was um, a special thing to have this single woman um, being active as a healer, um, having this, um, this, like say, strange life somehow. So it was also a topic in the village, of course. Her um, years in, um, in Appenzell were um, probably the most productive years also. There are many, many drawings um, from that from these years, but at the same time, she also continued her um, research practices. One experiment which is um, quite known is this um, so-called polarization of marigolds, an experiment she conducted in 1953. And um, it said that um, by swinging her pendulum in the garden over a bed of marigolds, she managed to polarize, to um, um, change somehow the, 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 the way the marigolds um, grow in a way that um, they would produce multiple additional flowers, blooms. So um, after a short time, apparently, the one marigold would um, grow um, five flower heads, seven flower heads, nine flower heads. It's um, of course something which is not, um, it's not, uh, it can't be explained by, um, by a traditional um, botany. So it's, it's like this unexplainable um, experiment and also, also a, one of these um, questions myths around um, Emma Quint. <laughs> Sorry, it's okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. Yeah, it's all good. All right, okay. So I continue. I think what's um, interesting about this very experiment is that um, that apparently it was um, important to Emma Quince because she hired a photographer, a local photographer. Um, to document these pictures. And we have these very beautiful pictures um, in, in her archive and also the following one where we see a um, maquette that uh, she did to kind of um, prepare this uh, experiment she did on the, on the marigolds in the garden. And uh, we have here the hand of the photographer who who took this picture. So it was important for her to have this experiment documented and to have it also somehow for, for um, a future um, audience. Emma Quince um, dies in uh, 1963 in Waldstadt, um, most likely from cancer. And what we have here on the slide is uh, what is um, considered as her last drawing. We see it's a very reduced drawing. It's a pyramid shape with the yellow on top and the yellow always, um, or the, yeah, the yellow is one of the few um, colors. We have some, uh, some hints what it could mean. And it usually it's on the upper part of the drawings and it um, somehow symbolizes the, the spiritual, the divine.
So um, what happened after Emma Quant's death? How she was discovered? And um, what can we say about her legacy now? Here we have um, what I already mentioned, an uh, image of the Emma Quant's foundation where the estate is located, where these drawings which are now in Hong Kong are coming from and will sometime return to also, um, which was opened in 1986. After Emma Quant's death, the drawings went, um, or the estate went first to the sisters and then later to the nephew who were not interested in this um, in this practice of their um, like strange aunt at all. And so it was uh, um, like the lucky, um, the big luck that um, and Anton C. Meyer, this former patient um, kept interest in this, in this practice. And he um, took over the estate from the nephew and he was uh, extremely fascinated by the by Emma Quant's by this figure and um, did everything really <laughs> um, um, to, to promote this, this work. And he was the one who went to um, various um, um, curators and so on to, to, to show them the, the drawings. And one of the first curators who reacted was um, Heine Wittmer. He was the director of the Argauer Kunsthaus then. And, um, he, um, he uh, started to work on, on what he called the case of Emma Quantz. And he also called this first exhibition of around 90 drawings in 1973, the case um, of Emma Quantz. It was a successful um, exhibition and uh, there was also a big media response. Then the other important figure or promoter of um, Emma Quentz was uh, Harald Seemann, the famous Swiss curator, the one who pretty much um, invented the job profile of the curator in, in, in the late 60s. And uh, he became familiar with, the, with Emma Quentz through the exhibition 73 in Aarau and um, would later include her in a, a row of exhibitions he did. Here we also see a picture of him with a Emma Quentz um, drawing in the back. And it's uh, said that he liked to finish his um, talks um, about his curatorial practice in general, practice in general with um, these um, pictures of the marigold polarization experiment by Emma Quentz. So there was this ongoing connection also. On the left, we see an exhibition view of the famous um, show called Bachelor Machines, where Emma Quince was one of the very few um, female artists on display. And here we see an exhibition which was called Visionary Switzerland, taking um, place in 1991 at the Kunsthaus Zürich. And what is um, interesting here is uh, we see the way um, Harald Seemann displayed these drawings. He displayed them on a plinth in a lying down position, which should um, pay tribute to, um, on the one hand side, the way they, 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 um, they were made, but mainly also the way they were used. So here we have this idea of the responsiveness somehow of this drawing. They are not, they're like the contrary of this concept of l'art pour l'art, but they are um, tools, they are, um, they are, um, they are like images of consultation somehow, and uh, they respond to the viewer. And uh, this is uh, like um, a way Simon wanted to emphasize this. And what's also interested is, interesting is that he included a stone from the query where the INR comes from into the exhibition. Nevertheless, um, Heine Wittmann as well as uh, Simon um, put Emma Quentz more or less um, in the same category, which was the category of the outsider. They had this fascination for these um, so-called individual mythologies, um, how Simon called it. Um, they had this uh, fascination for, for um, the obsessive aspects of this practice also. And it was, it took some, some more time. It was uh, one exhibition, one particular exhibition that, that tried to take Emma Quentz out of this category. And it was um, this exhibition we see um, here called Oset Echo. 
um, at the Centre Culturel Suisse in Paris in 1992, organized um, by Bice Kuriga, the young Hans Ulrich Obrist and Bernard Markade, with the declared aim to take out Emma Quentz of the out of this very category of the outsider and introduce her into the contemporary art field. And they did that um, in um, juxtaposing her works with um, works of 45 international contemporary artists, such as um, Sigma Polke, Isa Gensken, Rosemary Trockel, or Mike Kelly. So this was an uh, important moment um, for the reception of Emma Quentz. Nevertheless, by that time, Emma Quentz was more or less a Swiss, probably a European phenomenon, and it took another um, 12 to 13 years until she became, until was the first step was done to, to make her an international phenomenon. And the important exhibition for that was um, a show called Three Times Abstraction, created by Katrin de Zeger at the Drawing Center, which showed um, the works of Hilma of Klimt, of Emma Quentz and Agnes Martin. And the idea was to, to um, paying tribute to these, um, to Hilma of Klint and Emma Quentz as pioneers of abstraction in putting her, um, putting them together with Agnes Martin, who was by then, um, there was no discussion about her reputation and she was um, a renowned artist or abstract artist. So the idea was really to, to, to bring them together in a self-evident way and to kind of, um, um, get over these discussions whether um, Emma Quentz is an artist or not, or what is exactly the artistic aspect of her practice. This um, exhibition at the Drawing Center was um, important for um, the international reception, for instance, Massimiano Gioni, who is um, another important promoter of Emma Quentz, he got to know um, her work through the Drawing Center exhibition. And he included her work also in a, in a, in a row of exhibition. Here we have um, the, um, the Biennale, the, the Venice Biennale in 2013, which was um, this, this, um, this exhibition um, about blurring the line also between professional artists and amateurs, insider and outsiders, and um, reuniting also art artworks with other works of figurative expression. And in this context, um, um, Emma Quentz was also an important figure. And now if we look at the last years, we have another like peak of attention um, of Emma Quentz. Here only very quickly three images of recent exhibitions. Here we have um, the exhibition called World, World Receivers, which took place 2018 at, at the Limbach House Munich, and which put together the mediumistic practices of Hilma of Klint, Georgina Houghton, and Emma Quentz. And then, of course, the very important exhibition at the Serpentine Gallery in London in 2019 called Visionary Drawings, which traveled further to um, the museum in Such, in the Swiss um, um, mountains in the eastern part of Switzerland. Now, to summarize these um, developments, that developments that have accompanied the, um, the have accompanied the reception history of Emma Quentz and are probably the foundation of um, Emma Quentz's um, success or attention today. We see two main developments. One is um, the interest or, or it's not even the interest, it's rather the urge or the necessity of art history to, to start looking at the fringes of what was what's recorded what's transmitted what is told and discussed and um, to look at figures that were marginalized because of many reasons because of their gender because of their origin um, because of the race and so on so this development is definitely important to for this rediscovery of emma quants and the other important development is um, uh, the kind of expansion of the concept of art 
itself or the, of the artwork itself. So this um, uh, the expansion um, towards other disciplines, towards other media and so on, which um, is more or less like the basis for um, for uh, how we understand Emma Coins today. And um, this is also to come to an end now slowly is also the basis of the exhibition I am working on, which um, opens hopefully opens in uh, late January at the Argauer Kunsthaus. And um, the, the idea, the concept is to show how Emma Kunz was um, accomplishing, practicing a, or um, having a holistic practice and thought in a time where this was not usual, but nowadays exactly this holistic um, approach seems very natural and topical if you look at contemporary art. So um, there is this idea of the expanded concept of art. Um, she moved freely between the disciplines. She did not make any difference between art or non-art. And she was lighting up her practice, her art practice, to, be to, um, to a wide range of aspects, to research, medicine, natural history, as well as the magical, the visionary, or the supernatural. So we have this um, free movement and use of different disciplines, which is kind of self-evident and natural in um, many practices today. And this is like the starting point where we put um, around 60 um, drawings of Emma Coens, many of them also shown for the very first time into dialogue with contemporary artists. Here we have a, one example, it's Shana Moulton who um, did a work around Emma Coens. So some of the artworks we refer explicitly to her practice, but many others were more um, refer or mirror aspects around um, the practice of Emma Coens. So, there are various keywords coming up like um, animism, ecology, radistasia, vision, um, mapping is something which comes up again. Healing, of course, healing also as a as a um, as a very uh, topical um, theme right now. Of course, in the pandemic, we are um, where we have uh, these discussions about also. Um, like on the political level, we have this, this um, discussions about how to heal the soul of a nation, for instance. And I think in this context, it's super interesting and super important also to discuss and think about art and healing and how this, um, um, how we can see and discuss this also from a today's perspective. And here it's um, also to, to end this, um, it's probably more like a, 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 a preview in which direction the, the reception could also move. It's that um, when I talk to artists about Emma Coins, this um, holistic approach is very important. And it's somehow also this um, idea of, um, of uh, her worldview that puts um, human beings, nature, the visionary, the cosmic, everything into a continuum which is not that much um, centered on the human being, which is also mirroring the, let's say, post-anthropocentric -anthropo approaches we have, um, which are discussed a, a lot in theory and philosophy right now. So this is also like one angle which is, um, which is uh, interesting. And uh, yeah, I could tell you much more about this exhibition, but that would be probably another talk. I have here um, the, the list of contemporary artists. And on the left, I have um, one uh, picture of one drawing of Emma Coens, which is um, important to me also because uh, it shows how Emma Coens was, um, is, but also was an artist's artist for a long time. This is a drawing which was bought by Meret Oppenheim, the famous um, surrealist painter from that exhibition in 73 at the Argauer Kunsthaus and which shows already these connections and which shows that apparently Emma Coens was also very dear to Meret Oppenheim who would like seen from, from distance would have another entirely other practice. Yeah, so I think uh, 
this is um, this was a bit uh, of an introduction, and um, I'm open to questions, of course. Thank you so much, Yasmin. I will stop the the presentation probably, or um, uh, I can go back anytime. Sure. So we can see everybody's face. Uh, I can do a gallery view here. Lovely. Yeah, so actually, I do have an immediate question uh, respond, uh, re like, uh, responding to your presentation is like in your upcoming show, um, do you know are the artists already like influenced by Emma Kunz in their practice or is it more of an invitation to invite them to respond to the to uh, Kunz's work? Mm -hmm. Actually, it's it's like a mix. Some of the artists I invited, um, I knew that they um, they have a practice and they have um, have um, dealt with immigrants previously. For instance, Agnieszka Breszanska, who's a Polish um, painter, drawer, photographer, um, who had a residency a couple of years ago in 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 Zurich and who, who became. Um, familiar with Emma Quince and um, had already worked around her, so I invited her. At the same time, I invited other artists, and um, the, I was surprised as I invited other artists because I was interested in their practice in um, connection with um, Emma Quince, and I was surprised how familiar they were themselves already with um, Emma Quince. So that's that was something I did not know. For instance, I invited Koshka Makuga because of her um, her works around historical female figures, um, which I find very interesting. And uh, she told me that um, she has uh, been thinking already about um, a work around Emma Quentz for a while. So that, that was more than of a coincidence. Thank you, Yasmin. We also got a question uh, in the chat box. Uh, it's from Rodrigo. So, hello. Thank you for the great talk. I was wondering about the challenges of curating these artworks, which are part of larger practices, healing practice, rituals, connections with space, etc., that go beyond only visual art. So, how do you, as a curator, approach this in order to give the audience a better understanding of the holistic nature of Emma Kuhn's works? Mm -hmm. It is an indeed a very good question, a very important question also. And um, I think I was um, in the, yeah, I think it, it, it was accompanying the, my, the work I'm, I've been doing on this project from the very beginning, because I think it's not, let's say, enough to show the drawings only, because there is much more than these drawings. And uh, so, one uh, way to react on this is the very dialogue with the contemporary artist because they are, and it's, this is really important that the, the, the approach of the contemporary artist goes beyond the visual um, level of the drawing. So it's really not a visual um, uh, dialogue. So I think many are first surprised when they see the contemporary artworks because there is no obvious um, link but I see the links in um, in the links between these works to other elements of her practice. And um, what else we will have is a, a um, additional space um, dedicated to her um, practice, um, to her healing practice, to her researches and so on with um, archival material. We will show that pendulum. And what we will also do is um, we will have like um, stations where people can listen to extracts from these interviews done um, with patients, friends, and so on from uh, from Emma Quince after her death. And I think this is also very important to to get a feeling what is the source of information we have about her. So I think for me it was also important not to um, not to reproduce the like the famous. Um, prophecies and anecdotes about particular drawings and, and about her life, but to really also show that that um, it's an unstable um, reception also, and to show where is the where, the, where does this information come from that we are referring to, so. 
Thank you, Yasmin. Uh, we got another question. Um, this is from Harold. Is there any research to explain the knowledge contained in the drawings of Emma Kunz with works that come from other cultures, such as like Tibet, for example? Actually, um, actually not. Actually, the context of of, um, of non-European um, culture is just very recently introduced, I think, to the to the um, research of Emma Kunz, and I find it a a, a very interesting um, point to start. Um, also, but I think there is there is definitely work to be done. There were many many other attempts to kind of try to understand <laughs> this work. So there were one um, reappearing. Um, um, uh, discussion is about, uh, or like the comparison somehow is uh, with um, the mandalas of um, Jung, C.G. Jung, um, the the psychology, um, the the um, Zurich-based um, psychologist, and um, which were like this idea of, of uh, inner expressions also. So there, there have been research done there. Then there have been um, comparisons to the to the to to the realm of, of diagrams. How, how um, research in diagrams, how diagrams work somehow? Would that be something to to refer to to these drawings? There were researches in um, in um, musicology somehow in in harmonical um, research and and concepts. Whether this could be uh, a um, a source of uh, understanding, so there were these um, various approaches. But um, I think it would be interesting to to once have a, a research done that would put all these different um, impacts um, next to each other, and also to definitely to 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 develop. I mean, there is a bit this research into the, the mandala. Um, um in the field of the mandala and the use of a, of a mandala but um i think it's not very in-depth thank you yasmin so i think we can open questions to everyone here on site in hong kong and also uh online as well um harold would you like to speak directly i can unmute you unmute you Yeah, um, a lot for the for this wonderful introduction into the work of Emma Kurz. Um, Harald Seemann, he was one of my teachers, and uh, I uh, can confirm that he ended very often with this amazing photography of these wonderful flowers. And I know a doctor in Vienna, and he is using drawings to heal his patients. And I gave him a book about Emma Kuhns, and he was very surprised to see her flow of energy. And uh, well, I, I can contact him. Maybe he would like to contact you. That probably is one of a few people who can read this and understand it because he's using drawings to do the same more or less. Uh, we art historians, we are not rich enough no. to understand it. <laughs> Yeah. No, I think this is really, uh, th that would be really nice. I think it's also, I mean, um, there is all, always this, this discussion if it's legitimate to, um, to, to, to talk about the Macquans in the art context, which I also find an interesting question because there is definitely these other, um, these other fields that are um, where she is um, vividly discussed as well. So this is really an, an another reality. But I think what we can say is that Emma Quantz is now what she is finally also because of the art context and um, things are kind of um, merging into each other. But it is of course also that um, many of the people talking and thinking and writing about Emma Quantz are from the art context. And as you say, we are art historians and uh, um, have uh, other interests and are probably more interested in the contexts rather than uh, would uh, I think it's also better we shouldn't even try to to start really um, like uh, interpreting single forms and, and so on 
So, and, but I think it's really interesting also to, to have these other voices. And for instance, for the exhibition, for me, it's also very important to have um, for, the, for the programs, for, for instance, to have um, people from other fields and experts from other fields talking about, um, talking about their points. Mm -hmm. That's, that's really funny that you mentioned this, because I remember we had the same discussion with Harald Seemann uh, in the early 90s when I studied. And uh, then he said that Emma Kunz, she, she herself, she never has seen herself as an artist. Yeah? So she, for, for, for her, these things have been to, like tools, something like that. Yeah, for, for her daily practice and to visualize the energy, things like this. And I, I like the idea that Harald Seemann, he, he was one of the first guys who brought it into the art scene, yeah, mm -hmm. to make it visible for us. And I think it's also, I mean, she definitely did not consider her as an artist, but um, it is also, I mean, that the idea or the image um, of an artist that she had by her time was also like the entirely um, opposite uh, to, to what she did. I mean, there was really this, um, she, in, in her um, context, she, we know that she knew um, at least one artist, but who was a very conventional painter of, um, of landscapes um, in Switzerland. So this was an entirely different uh, approach and, um, I like the idea to, um, to to think about whether she could probably nowadays um, um, uh, identify herself a bit more as an artist because nowadays yeah. we obviously uh -huh. have another understanding of what art can be and can do. So I think it's also was, always about the time. Was this uh, Alfred Welty? Yes. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Yasmin. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Yasmin. Do you have any questions from here? No. Nope. <laughs> no problem. And more questions from online audience? Last couple questions. All right. Then I think, well, thank you so much, Yasmin, for sharing. And thank you, everybody, for participating. I think this is also um, like a starting point for everybody around the globe to know Emma Kunz more and also to really dive into the, uh, her practice and how we can really um, carry on maybe some of the spirits in her work. So, um, well, today's the, I think we only have an hour before we really close Garden of Six Seasons. Uh, and we hope uh, our audience online can maybe also check out on the, on the later uh, traveling sites in Europe and also in, um, in, uh, in Nepal as well. So I think that's called it the day. And uh, thank you, Yasmin, again for uh, being our speaker. And thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you very much for uh, listening and um, I hope to see everybody again online or, or in real. And, I would uh, love to see everybody in real life, yes. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you everybody. Bye-bye.